famous Greek philosopher Epictetus said, it doesn't matter what happens to you, only how you interpret what happened. What is pitch panic? What is pitch panic? That, well, that's I, I that's can, our word for stage fright. Our yeah, stage I, I fright. will just... Because uh, uh, it's alliterative. It, it, it is crippling. Uh, that's my definition for it. Um, I, I could talk about it, and I mean, this is what part of what Peter does for a living, and um, not having it, but treating it. He he helped me early on with it. Um, I had um, a longtime partnership with somebody who had been an actor and then been in improv, and um, and so when we would go in, she would do the. I know it's really hard to believe this, but I was at one time painfully shy and painfully afraid of everything. And um, I think that it's just, it's, it, it's a curse. If you, but luckily there, are, and I think this is the great part of the, one of the great parts of the book is the exercises that, you know, Peter, has put in here and the research that's done and all of that really helps. You do not have to be a slave to pay, to stage fright. You really don't. There are, and again, sometimes it's great to have somebody, I mean, it's okay to be a quiet person, but not what I was back in my youth, which is scared. As, you can be scared, you can feel it and still go forward. And I, you know, I mean, he can give you, Peter can give you, you know, the definition of it, but I think what people really want to know is what does it feel like? And I think it feels crippling. Well, and I just want them to be hopeful about it because it is something that can be dealt with. I've, I've, uh, if I can come out of that phase of my life um, and become, sort of people call me uh, a schmoozer now, I am known, my friends, uh, but I'll tell you quickly, just real quickly before you get into the technical areas of it, which is really important, is that I would go to parties and be a schmoozer and not have any fear at all. And then people would say, well, why do you have so much trouble? And, and I couldn't tell you why, but that, that's what it was for me. I, and so the fear goes, when you teach too, I think the fear on that first day of teaching, and I'm happy to have it, I still have a little bit of that anxiety, oh, can I still do this? And I think when you lose that, there's a difference between having it and knowing you have it and then knowing how to deal with it, you know? And you just go forward and deal with it anyway. But I kind of like having that, and Peter's taught me how to, it's one of the things we talk about in the book, is turning that feeling of anxiety into a feeling of anticipation. That's one really big thing that helps, I think, for me anyway. Now, go when, ahead. When we were interviewing people, I, I asked people who were on the other side of the desk, how do you react to people who are nervous? And we had an interesting range of responses from one friend of ours who has several Academy Awards, um, said, if somebody comes into my office and they're pitching and they are scared, I want to get them out of my office as quickly as possible. They have no place in there. Just send me the script. All the way to, um, you're familiar with Slam Dance. The, the guy who started it lives down the street from me is a friend of mine. A lot of celebrities on Peter mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. And... Nice block Pete, party. Peter Baxter is sweetheart of a guy. And he said, I love film. So if somebody comes in and they're really nervous, it's my job to calm them down as much as possible because if they have anything to contribute, I want to find it out. And so if I have to dig for it and do some you know, extra work to make them comfortable, I'm happy to do it. Mm -hmm. So you have that whole continuum. Yeah. And of course, you never know the person you're pitching I'll, to. I'll tell the Nicole Fox story. Nicole Fox is the person I was talking about who didn't work with Bonnie Raitt, but did work with Bonnie Hunt. She says that it was a time when a guy came in very anxious and he was doing too much. He was, this is the multitasking thing, you know. She's, he had a ball up in the ceiling that 
reminded her of like her freshman dance or whatever. And she's like, <laughs> just let's put everything. She's a very kind person. She's a, one of the nicest people on planet Earth. I think Peter will back me up on that. She's just lovely. And she said, let's just put everything away. And she just kind of like got to him on a human level. And then the pitch went very well. So again, it, to me, it goes back to being authentic. Um, you know, don't come in with a lot of visual effects and thinking you're gonna, and that's gonna hide your anxious nervousness. Because people see, people, most people are not nasty. Most people, in my experience, are human beings too, and they want you to succeed. I don't believe in that old myth about Hollywood that, you know, people are out there to kill you. There's always gonna be a group of that, but. You know. Well, it's, it's nice to know, first of all, that there aren't haves and have-nots. Everybody will get nervous under the right conditions. I'm nervous right now. Oh. Did you know that? Um, <laughs> Something I said? No, nothing. Oh. You don't okay. make me nervous at but, all. But there are a lot of things you can do to learn to manage it better. And so we talk a lot about how to do that. And we talk a lot about breaking it down to see what it actually is and how at each stage of it, you can learn to control it better. Mm -hmm. so, so again, you never think in terms of getting rid of it as much as mm -hmm. managing it. One and, of the, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, it just, I mean, it's- We didn't rehearse this at all, I'm sorry. It, it's, <laughs> it's interesting that it's a double-edged sword that you want a certain amount of anxiety because it's motivating, it makes you practice harder, mm -hmm. take it more seriously. Um, and, you know, actors have an expression when they get on stage and feel no fear at all. They refer to phoning in their performance. It's, you gotta have something, and that as you get better at learning how to manage it, you also learn to redefine it. And again, instead of calling it anxiety, to call it excitement. Mm -hmm. And that you want a certain amount. If you watch athletes before a, a competition, you know, sometimes you've seen boxers being slapped across the face, football players, you know, they're slamming on their, uh, their shoulders and stuff, and they wanna get them up and they want the energy level up to a certain level. But it's, you don't want it to where it goes so far over that you can't do anything. And, and a big part of the problem is I, I was saying before that we're not we're not built to multitask. Like, can you multitask? I don't enjoy it, but I can, and I notice my brain doesn't. I'm going to argue with you right away. Oh, I'm cutting you off. You say no, you can't. Okay, I can. Now, there are <laughs> two things. Key, yeah. You can multitask <laughs> if one of the tasks is learned to a level of automaticity. So, in other words, driving a car is a pretty complicated act. And I'm sure that you could drive in your car with me and have a really high-level conversation while you do it. Yeah. But let's say you'd just driven up this big hill, and all of a sudden we hit a detour sign, and you have to back down this windy mountain road. Your conversation is gone. You can't do that. Right. Now, what a lot of people do is they task switch very quickly. So they do one thing, then they switch to another in the back. You know, hey, can you read and listen to some you know, really complex classical music? Oh, yeah, no problem. Well, you can listen for a while and you can read for a while. But if you're saying you're doing both and I say, OK, um, you've just read this passage and we've just heard this music. Describe for me the way he used language differently than most other writers do while you also explain what he did in the music to get this feeling of rhythm by using a pedal point along with, you know, no idea. If you believe that you really can, try this experiment. You can do it after we leave. <clears throat> Take an expression. I, I like the phrase, jewelry is shiny. And spell out each letter aloud while you sign your signature you will not be able to do it. But if I say just sign your signature or just spell it out, you can do it with no trouble. Um, if I say to you, um, 
you know, I can give you any number of tasks that you will absolutely not be able to do in simultaneity. Just too many things. Because working memory, which is the part of your memory that actually does stuff, is very limited in terms of what it can do. If I say, you know, multiply uh, 87 times 92 in your head, you could probably do it, but you're maxed <laughs> out. And if I say, okay, let's go to 3,748 times 873, no. It's just, we hit our limits. <laughs> and so there are only so many things you can do simultaneously. Yeah. So one problem is, if you have, uh, let me go back a little bit. Um, before you do anything, anything in your life, you make a prediction about it first. If something as simple as, I'm thirsty, I'm going to go to the fridge, you've made a prediction that there's going to be something in there to drink, you'll get there safely, you, you've done this so many times, you don't stop each time to do it, but all of these predictions are there. Um, when you said, hey, let's have uh, Jeffrey and Peter back, you made the prediction that maybe you know, this time they'll be okay. Well, I begged them, so they had to say, yeah. And eventually, they'll <laughs> say something. In. But you make a prediction about what you're going to do. When you're put in a fear-provoking situation, your fears are going to start getting pretty negative pretty fast. If you're thinking about all the things that can go wrong, oh no, here's the part I always mix up. I hope I don't do it. And there's a couple of people out there that look really bored. You're starting to hit your limit. Mm -hmm. And something's going to give. So one of the things that people do is they destroy themselves this right. way. I did. I did, I did I, that a lot. Yeah. I don't want to brag, but I'm going to. I'm an expert at palmistry. And so I do demonstrations when I talk about this stuff by reading people's palms. And so what I will do is take somebody's hand and I'll start looking at the lines very carefully, little ridges, and then I'll say, now imagine that I'm doing yours. You're very stubborn. When you believe you're right, I think you're kind of unshakable, yeah. no matter how much pressure is on you. Now, don't just say right. Think about it for a second. Think of instances where it's happened. Oh, yeah. Now, I go to the person next to you. You're incredibly flexible. So even if you think you're right, if somebody shows you the evidence that you're wrong, you're willing to switch and you'll believe the evidence. Does that feel like you? Oh, uh, depends on what day you're getting me. The point is, if I can show <laughs> you where you're wrong, are you going to stick to that idea? Oh. And, you'll say, and if I say, well, think about it for a minute. Now, the point of the demonstration, besides me bragging, is when you get somebody going down an avenue of thought, what they'll start doing is looking for examples of that thing. So, in other words, if I said to you, I want you to think of things that a certain politician you don't like has done that you don't like, you will start coming up with item after item after item after item. If I was to say, I want you to think of things this politician you didn't like actually did that were okay, you would probably do that too. But once I set you down that course, you're not going to look for non-exemplars, you're going to look for exemplars. Now, when you're starting to make predictions about where you can screw up, you have no trouble saying, I could forget this, I could mess up that, what happens if I do this, what happens if they say this? Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, let's say, for example, um, permit me to go Greek on you. Okay. Um, famous, uh, famous Greek philosopher Epictetus said, it doesn't matter what happens to you, only how you interpret what happened. So now, let's say you're pitching. I'm the person you're pitching. I'm the important person. I don't get to feel important very often, so this is a big moment for me. And as you're watching me and you're pitching to me, you see this. 
<laughs> what happens in your head? What are you thinking? Well, I could think either maybe you have insomnia and maybe you didn't get a good night's sleep yeah. or that I'm boring. What's the one you're going to go for? <laughs> Probably that I'm boring. Yeah. Uh, you're, I, you're pitching me and you see this. Well, maybe you have to call someone. Okay. You're, you're good at this, but basically, where right. are you going first? You, you'd rather be elsewhere <laughs> and not in front and, of me. And yeah. so, you know, we teach people the skill of learn how to come up with alternative interpretations. So when you see the yawn, say, maybe it's three hours sleep. But the person, the, the place where they go to first is going to be. And as, as you're thinking of what you should be doing in your pitch and the fact that you're boring people and what happens if I forget this next section where I always get tripped up and, and you can't multitask, guess what happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things... So we teach yeah. people how to deal with all this. In my own experience, one of the things that you know, to put to, to tell us specific about this is one of the things that I used to do and that I when, when we do practice pitching in class or when I have a friend who needs to make a pitch is if you make a mistake this is kind of like that inside outside perception that Peter was talking about if you make a mistake and you say, oh, sorry, um, I made a mistake, uh, I'd like to go back and do that over, that's, that's you're slitting your wrists. Um, you're doing a lot of visual, the visual that's displays what I do. today. Very Mimicry. Good. Very good. Um, I learned not to, I got very lucky early on and I had someone I was pitching to say, don't do that. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> don't do that. Um, <laughs> And, and um, I've been very fortunate. And, and again, this is a this is this is what I say to everybody. I don't really learn. Think we learn by what we do right. I think we learn by making mistakes. So I tell young people, and I tell anybody who is new to pitching, prepare to make mistakes, and that's where you'll learn. And keep notes. Keep a notebook of your pitches, and and where, whether it's business or it's show business or whatever, and we said at the very beginning, they're intermingling more and more. Keep a you know keep a tally of where you think you went wrong, because that'll help you. And I, I don't want to keep pitching the book here, but well, we have a chapter. What book is that, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> but we, do you, do you have any duct tape? <laughs> well, make it stick. If That's you so look unkind. It. That's so cover I was the on the book? cover there. Yeah, they had the duct tape. Right. He was going to um, duct tape my. But we and have, I've been so quiet today. And, but we have a And he's shushing me now. <laughs> well, I didn't want to do it physically. Um, we have an entire chapter, a long one in the book, on how to practice. Because people think they don't have to practice their pitch. Oh, that's very foolish. And, you know, one of the things we say is after you think you have your pitch down, take out your iPhone and video it. And do it from start to finish. Don't if you screw up, don't stop and go back to the big. Go right through the whole thing, and you'll see where all your problems are. Mm. And the parts where you're searching for the right way to say this, or mm -hmm. the, the sentence that you trip over, you need to learn those because you give extra time. You learn how to do mm -hmm. it. And if you do it enough, you start getting the feeling of here's what it's like being in the room where I can't go. Oops, let me start again. Mm -hmm. I'll give you um, an example of where this will be useful outside of show business. Um, I have a student who for three years now has, he had the exact same job at Disneyland that Steve Martin had. So he would, you know, he was doing, he was outside part, Pirates of the Caribbean doing magic and he is being groomed to be an Imagineer. Now that's half engineer and half entertainer because he has to write scripts and he has to help design new parks and things like that. So, so he said his biggest problem is um, he has a condition and um, I want to keep this, you know, I'm not going to say what it is, but he, they are extremely considerate about it and when he's pitching, they tell him, slow down, slow down. You, you don't need to rush through this. That's another thing I think people make mistakes. They go too fast. 
And Peter's covered a lot of this in like the pitch and the, the voice and all of those things and the eye contact. But I really think we make a mistake when we want to get through something. Now, how do you expect other people to be excited about what you're excited about if you're so excited that you can't wait to get it done? And I don't think we tell, you know, we're so focused on the plot and the, you know, my school of thought is forget the plot and think about the story. Think about the characters wow. and slow down and make bring me in. And if you're too anxious to do that, then work on those things. I love Peter's whole thing. I wish I could take credit for it, but I love how we end the we end the book with the practice chapters, and then we take the the reader into the room. And also, I love. I'm going to just mention Carol Hafner again, who. Um, is the chair of my department and a very accomplished screenwriter. And she developed a mantra to help her with her stage fright. And it's, they can't eat my, whatever else they do, they can't eat my children. Oh, which is wonderful, <laughs> right? And she yeah. said it helped her because she tried, she tried the thing of imagining everybody naked and right. it didn't really work for her. And sure. uh, so, and, and, and um, so, and she, you know, I just think that says it all. You know, you find something that, that's what Peter taught me early on in our relationship is, I can tell you all these things. You have to find, and that's what we hope people who read the book do, is they find the things in there. They won't all work for everybody. That would be crazy. But they find the thing that works for them. And they use it. one of the things I'm really proud of in this book is that we didn't just give a couple examples and it's not what we think. It's about, you know, there, there are books out there like that one person telling you what you should do. And I think the great thing about the book, um, and I had to be convinced about this in the early stages of it, is there's lots of con contrary points of view. You know, not everybody agrees with everybody else. And I think that's really helpful. I think that's what you'd need. There is no one size fits all. Well, you know, piggybacking on that idea that May, Jeffrey came up like. with a, a good idea. Um, I get one a year. <laughs> which is that we should interview a lot of people who are successful at pitching and get, you know, collect some really good stories making these points. So it's not just us saying, here's what we do. And then the part I added being a, a boring pedant which again is redundant, is I said, there's also science behind this stuff. So mm -hmm. let's go look at what the research says. And between the two of them, it, it's really nice that, you know, as you know, it's better you know why you wouldn't want our ideas. Right. But uh, well, we I'll a, say for you that... We, we oh, that a, a go pretty, ahead, finish up. We give a, a pretty good picture of you know the way things work and why they work mm -hmm. and what the research behind them is. Mm -hmm. You know we probably have like 250 references in there to yeah, to bore right. people. So if they have trouble sleeping, it just we had to put a warning on the book: do not carry this book. You may get drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be just, doing an audio version. I think we just yes we do, and you know that was a complete surprise to me. I I don't think it was a surprise to Peter, but. Then I thought, well, it's McGraw-Hill. That makes sense. And then also, I'm talking to my friend Gary, who is all out all through the book. He's a producer, and he's got Emmys. That's not the Emmy person we were talking about. He's got Emmys. She's got Academy Awards. Um, but but um, he was saying that, of course, all of this is, it makes sense. All of it makes sense. It's just that the, the guy who did our book actually is a guy who does all the business books for Audible. So oh, you didn't read? The, you, you weren't the readers? We were not. Um, oh, God, They wanted no. people to understand. They the also reader. wanted an actor. <laughs> and then and nine tenths out of, you know, nine tenths of the time, because I subscribe to Audible, I do like a book a month. And because I, I have such a long drive, you know, Los Feliz to the marina, I mean to Playa. So... I, I um, no, I'm really happy about that. And there's a Kindle version, you know, oh, of course. course. Which is terrible because we can't autograph those well. 